Hello and welcome to the Artist Spotlight with myself, Simi Jackson, and my guest today, Joshua LaRock. Josh is internationally recognised as a predominantly figurative artist. His exquisite paintings are an ode to the past filtered through a contemporary life. LaRock's portraits and figurative pieces alike are memorable for both their emotive quality and for evoking an eerie present feeling. Now I pinched that from your website, Josh, so I know you'll have heard that before. But welcome everybody. Says. Well, thank you for having me. It's is. good to be with you. Good to be with you, Josh. Um, welcome. I know you haven't um, done this with me before yet, so I'm going to try and make it really smooth and easy, and I won't ask you anything that you don't want to, want to answer. So. Oh, I'm all good. You okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the ground running by first of all just saying that's a beautiful piece behind you. I know you just told me. Um, a little bit about it. So tell us about what the piece is for, first of all, that you've got coming up. Uh, well, thanks. Yeah, so this is um, this is a piece for uh, my new show that I'm working on. It'll be a solo show with Maxwell Alexander Gallery, uh, set to open this September. Um, and it's sort of a new genre for me. This will be my second showing of um, uh, Southwest-inspired paintings. Um, so, you know, there'll be... Uh, Quite a few pictures of uh, cowboys. This is one of the first cowgirls I've done, which I'm excited about. Um, and uh, I've got some uh, some Native Americans, some indigenous indigenous Americans, and it's exciting. I'm really I'm really enjoying uh, kind of this new you know this new direction, and, uh, and it's been really well received. So um, yeah, that's the long and short of it. Okay, and tell us the size of that piece. So this is uh, this is about to be thirty by thirty. I haven't quite decided yet. You can see it's not fully stretched yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, that's basically what I plan, but I usually, I find that I like to give myself like an inch or two kind of wiggle room, and then I'll stretch it at the end and kind of crop it as I like. Yeah. Brilliant. So that's, um, that's... But being I, 30, the portrait, you know, the portrait's still about the size of my thumb. I don't know if you can tell the scale there uh, on the screen. But so it ends up being, you know, this really, really tiny, uh, tiny portrait. I'm used to doing more sort of like, uh, life size and just yeah. under, so it's kind of a challenge. What What was it that inspired you to move in that way? That That was that's something I wanted to know. Yeah, well, um, it was kind of you know like anything, sort of an evolution. I started I started teaching uh, in Scottsdale mm -hmm. uh, several years, ago, the Scottsdale Art School. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you been there? I yeah, love it there. Times. I absolutely love it there. Yeah, I go every year in January. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, and uh, so I was there, I'm usually there in April, mm -hmm. right around the, uh, the Scottsdale Art Auction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a separate annual or whatever. But I just was not aware of the whole Western culture, the whole Western genre. I mean, I, you know, I think I had seen, you know, paintings of cowboys and things uh, before. Uh, and I was aware of Thomas Moran, mm -hmm. but I kind of always, he's a landscape painter. Uh, in the late 19th century, I always kind of considered him uh, to be part of the Hudson River School, despite the fact that he knew, or he, or he did paintings mostly of uh, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, um, things like that. And uh, anyway, so I just, it was a revelation to me to find out about these painters. And there were actually a lot of painters who had similar stories to mine, where, you know, they had studied in kind of like the European atelier systems, um, and, you know, as classical figurative painters. And then they taught, they brought that, the skills that they learned uh, to the West. Some people, you know, there was a group of artists who, who formed a society called the Taos Society of Artists. Mm -hmm. So they settled in Taos in Mexico. And, uh, and several of them actually, they studied with Bubaro, who was one of my favorites. So I just was, my eyes were really opened, um, you know, and I thought, you know, why not? And this is a part of my story as well. I'm from Texas, I was born in Austin. And so I just thought, well, let's see, we'll, we'll see where this takes me. So I, you know, I did a group of paintings and um, and I've enjoyed it. So well, don't stop. Just gonna keep it for. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't stop. It's it's absolutely beautiful. I think the thing that I love the most about this series or movement that you're going into is how you're so good at landscapes and so good at the portrait and you can pull them both together and we see the both of it um i don't know if that's like intentional in that sense or because you've definitely pulled the landscape into that kind of um genre way more than what you you normally did um was, was that sure. intentional to do that 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so like I said, going back to Moran, um, I, and you, you probably see that in some of even you know at, at the in progress stage of this painting. Mm -hmm. Um, I love his landscape paintings, and so I'm I'm really kind of drawing on that inspiration, mm -hmm. and I and I really I, kind of in my like own artistic just uh, you know nature, I, I would always question whether or not I wanted to be a landscape painter or a figurative painter because I just I love being outside, I love plein air painting. Mm -hmm. um, nature is just an endless source of uh, you know inspiration and beauty. So so I'm I'm not really enjoying that. I've been really enjoying kind of um, getting to explore that side and, and trying to figure out how to integrate it, which is tough, yeah. you know, because it's, it, they're, they're, um, and you don't often see it, you know, there's, there's usually a landscape painter or there's portrait painters and the landscape is sort of, you know, relegated to the background, uh, and can be relatively sort of fuzzy. And I just, I, I love to kind of dive into the details of some of the Hudson River School mm -hmm. sort of things. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm thinking about and juggling. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you then, since we've got that beautiful painting behind you, talk us through how yeah. you would, would come up with the concept of that and how it, how it gets to be where it's at now. I think that's something that everybody would want to know. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, uh, recently I've been in, uh, embracing sort of more digital medium mm -hmm. uh, in the sort of the design and concept phase of things. So, I'll uh, logistically, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take a trip out to the Southwest. I'll travel around, you know, it's usually a several day car trip. Um, and I'll have models booked to that have access to horses or, you know, their, they, they actually, their vocation has to do with, you know, um, uh, bring, you know, wrangling cows or, or whatever. And uh, so I'll, I'll just take copious amounts of photos. Um, I'll take, you know, really great, uh, you know, landscape photographs as much as I can. And then I'll take that and, you know, put it into the computer and then kind of just sort of sift through all of the, mm -hmm. uh, all of the images and find, find a pose that I like, find a landscape that I like. And then in Photoshop and even on my iPad, use like Pro, uh, uh, an app called Procreate. And, uh, I'll start to kind of, you know, place different backgrounds and different poses together. I'll change the lighting. Mm -hmm. I'll draw, you know, I can even draw. It's a really powerful way to just very quickly, uh, you know, try different thumbnails, try different ideas, um, and then see where like an idea uh, you know, goes and evolves. Um, and, and it's really nice to be able to do that quickly where, uh, that, the idea generation phase is just trying to call, you know, all of these ideas and narrow it down to a painting that's eventually going to, I'm going to have to sink weeks into. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I've been doing a lot of that. Once I'll, I'll come up with a group, uh, a group of paintings for, say, the show or a museum show or something like that, uh, then I'll get the drawings uh, onto the canvas and then just kind of go, go, you know, right into a, a full color uh, underpainting. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is the first pass. Of, you know, I'm sure it's hard to see given the you know, the webcam. Um, but just kind of getting the general sense of the light effects. You know, getting everything covered once, and then I'll take another second pass, which is Basically, the horse and figure uh, right now have, have been uh, gone over a second time, mm -hmm. and that's where the, the volume and the character and the details start to get worked out. And, I, and that's and that's where I'm trying to figure out how to integrate them together because she wasn't, you know, when I took the image, she was not against this green sky, mm -hmm. right? So part of it is trying to figure out how do I how do I make this sort of believe uh, a believable environment mm -hmm. where the you know the lights and everything. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, that's about that's where it ended up here. So yeah, that that's amazing. I, I I've got a couple of questions off of that, but one of them would be sure. what then makes you um put that into scale? So what makes you think then that you like you said that the, the lady's face is the size of your thumb. What makes you not yeah. bring her closer or push her further back and how do you decide that one? I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, sometimes things just sort of like end up where they end up mm -hmm. uh, in, in that in that design phase, um, and then I decide on the size based on you know a certain number of practical things like you know where is this going to fit in the show? Do I have too many big paintings? Mm -hmm. You know, does this need to be needed? But I also didn't want to do it so small that I wouldn't be able to actually you know with the with the size of the brush get in there and actually right. get some detail in. Yeah, yeah. You know, you couldn't you. You can do figures smaller, obviously. You're just going to be able to get less and less mm -hmm. uh, detail, mm -hmm. kind of more of this sort of posterized version. Um, so, so that's sort of how I ended up with this one. I, thought, I think her head's maybe an inch, an inch and a half, and I thought, okay, 
but I can still kind of actually render the portrait in a way that I enjoy. Is that any but, is that any easier doing it so small, or is it the same? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that, I think it's actually harder. <laughs> yeah, I thought you, you know, might say that. Because, say it again. I said I thought you might say that because it, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, you know, it's one square inch of canvas, but I probably spend about as much time on it as I do, you know, when the when the figure's seven or the the, the head is like seven or eight inches. Yeah. Um, so get a bigger brush out, right? And then some, and in some ways, it's easier because you can it, it, here if you know brush stroke is off by you know a millimeter or something like that, then it completely changes the facial structure or expression. If it's you know seven seven inches tall, then it's a completely different formula. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other thing to ask about this specific painting is painting the horse. Is that something that you've been familiar with? Have you done studies of of equine, you know, within the within that field, or how did that come about? And so it's a it's a you know learning in progress for mm -hmm. me. I've, I've really enjoyed that. I think that's been a lot of fun actually because uh, I mean they're just such a magnificent. Magnificent animals, first of all, yeah. um, but just you know the musculature and, and their face. I mean, even their facial expressions—they have so much personality. Mm -hmm. Their eyebrows and you know their nostrils. It's just it's. I've really had a lot of fun doing that and trying to play with the different textures of their fur. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been it's been a lot of fun. But I've I've had to learn. You know, I tried to learn a little bit more about you know equine anatomy and yeah. um, you know just figuring out what the skull that's underneath there. Uh, but it, you know, it's still kind of just responding to form, um, yeah. you know, it, 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 which is sort of like the sort of foundational level of what my training is. You mm -hmm. know, you just go in and you, you're presented with a model and you're just trying to uh, summon all of your observational skills to respond to the, you know, the delicate and, and nuanced volumes and color shifts and, mm -hmm. and value, value uh, uh, contrast and things like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk then for a minute. I mean, I'm just going to pull up some of my questions in case I forget them. But I, I wanted to yeah. talk more about um, your training um, because for anybody yeah. who um, doesn't know you and has, has just tuned in when we put this out there, um, obviously you, you studied at the Hudson um, River School for Landscape, so I've got and also that you were, I knew, I already knew that you were at Jacob with Jacob Collins. I didn't know about the Hudson River actually. Um, so can you tell us for folks who who have got no idea what that is as a formal education? How do you go about going into something like that? Um, I've got about five questions here for you, so if you could answer all of them, how do you go about applying for something like that? What was it like your time there? Was it something that you would do again? And um overall how's that shaped you now moving forward i guess is my <laughs> um all right let me see if i can keep those straight deep in order um i mean well so i uh so the this is what is known as sort of like the atelier mm -hmm. kind of forum or group or whatever atelier is basically just the, the french word for studio or workshop um and it was uh, it, it's sort of like an apprenticeship style uh, training, right? So it's not a formal education in the sense of like a degree um, or a diploma or anything like that. Uh, and various ateliers do it different ways, but they're they're more or less generally sort of centered around um, drawing and painting the figure, mm -hmm. right? Um, doing a lot of a lot of drawing and painting from the live model in mm -hmm. uh, graphite or charcoal, and then figuring out how to render that render that in oil paint. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so that's the general idea. So I studied uh, or apprenticed with Jacob Collins at a school that was, uh, at the time, it was called the Water Street Atelier, which is now um, transitioned into the Grand Central Academy mm -hmm. um, in Long Island City. So uh, I moved out to New York. I, at the time, I had found out about the, uh, the whole program through the Art Renewal Center mm -hmm. and their website. They have a, a, a approved atelier yeah. you know, list yeah. where the or they'll you know look at the program and kind of you know sign off on whether or not it holds up to their ideals of classical training and whatnot. And uh, so I was. This was 2006. I moved to New York. I was 23. And um, uh, the application process at the time was really interviewing with with Jacob and doing a cast drawing. So cast drawings are 
you know, you're taking a fragment of a statue like Michelangelo's ear or something like that, Michelangelo's David's ear, and then you're trying to render that, uh, and um, that was kind of this like weeding out process. But um, I would definitely do it again, absolutely. I think you know, um, there's nothing quite like being able to spend 40 hours a week just sort of zeroed in on on trying to understand uh, your technique. Mm-hmm. and the tools and, and the way that Jacob taught it was very uh, systematic in the sense that and a lot of them are like this where you know you're, you're sort of distilling the problem down into its component parts so it's how do we draw accurately how do we render that but how do we render it in graphite which is more forgiving say than oil painting mm-hmm. then how do we paint in oils but only use black and white which is called the design right mm-hmm. and then how do you do that in the model how do you do that on you know Instead of something that's going to be still for however long you decide to paint it, how then do you transfer those skills into a model which is going to move and shift, and 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 then how do you paint that in full color? So it was this progression that, that was really was really seamless. Um, so uh, uh, what was maybe the final question? How did that shape me as I as I? Yeah, how, yeah. How does that then push you to now where you're at, and how do you, how do you feel that that's kind of molded? where you're at, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean that the technically, I think is probably the, the, the main thing that that gave me the, the technical facility and also a base, a foundational group of concepts that I could use to do self learning. Right. So mm-hmm. I understood something about how light works, mm-hmm. right. It was just fundamental to physics or science or something like that, that I could then apply to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, with enough sort of determination or research or thinking or experimenting, I could kind of figure out, um, you know, the right answer, you know, so like as I'm, you know, now I even develop sort of like this process, uh, uh, the style of painting and even just the method of doing it, um, just sort of think about, okay, well, how am I, how am I going to bring all of these things together and integrate it? Given how I understand how light's going to interact, you know, you know, a different background will interact with the horse. So it's all this, you know, conceptual idea, um, and that I can trace directly back to uh, the ideas I learned at Jacobs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then just also I think maybe more in the philosophical realm, just sort of like a reverence for, um, you know, beauty and and the, um, you know. Um, uh, you know, and being in awe of light and just mm-hmm. sort of like how, you know, what it, you know, it's just it, it, endless amounts of, um, you know, things to be observed and learned. And, and so, um, yeah, I don't know, am I answering your question? Yeah, I'm just, I'm so interested. I, I guess I've got so many questions, sorry. Um, but I suppose that's the point, isn't it? But um, I, I suppose from there, I would say, a quick one to acknowledge is the fact that you went there at 23. So you went there from Texas to New York. How was that in itself, um, just moving across the country, away from home? Um, I don't know if you were a nervous person or shy or felt comfort. How how was that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely a nerve wracking experience. I mean, I, uh, um, I was exciting, of course, and I think you know a lot of things are easier at 23. Mm-hmm. You know, when you do, when you have very little um, responsibility, mm-hmm. you know, and you can live cheaply, and you know, it's all just an adventure, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I had gone to college. I actually got my degree in music business. Um, I wanted to be a musician at one point, and I was thinking about you know going and doing the business side. Um, but uh, and it was around that time that I had found out about the atelier system. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was very formative. I mean, I really, I, I spent 10 years in New York, um, met my wife there. Um, we had our first child there, you know I mean? And it was, but then also just this, the, the city and its culture, just being, you know, a subway right away from the Met mm-hmm. or, you know, uh, the Frick or just, you know, any number of things that, that were, that, you know, have been culturally significant, um, for, you know, a long time mm-hmm. uh, was was really a lot of fun, um, and uh, yeah, I would never I would never trade that for anything. I think. Would you ever move back, or is that chapter of New York done? Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I, th- I think maybe it's just like life stage. I love New York. Um, I think once we started having kids, mm-hmm. you know, it, just practically the logistics uh, of trying to live in New York uh, became substantially harder, you know. Not, you know, the obviously the expense mm-hmm. uh, is a huge part of that, but then just trying to wrangle kids in a small apartment and, mm-hmm. you know, wanting a yard. And, and we that, that was also where we, we decided we wanted to be near family, too. Mm-hmm. I think that became a higher priority. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how we ended up here in Maine. My, my family's in Texas, hers is, hers is here in Maine. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that eventually was sort of where, where yeah. we drew out. But I, who knows? I, I think I don't know. If there's one thing I've learned, is that you just don't know where life will take you. Yeah, right? of course. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess with that in mind, how have you found being in Maine? Because it's it is totally different. I, I I've wanted to tell you I've been to. Um, uh, I actually wrote it down because I knew I would forget the actual spa- the place's name. But it was oh, that was it Acadia National Park at Scudic Point. Oh. I couldn't remember where I'd yeah. been, but I've been a couple of times there and, and with with the brushes. Uh, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's such a beautiful place. So have you found the, the scenery there? Because it is totally different. Oh, it's amazing. I love it. I mean, we, you know, we've been coming, I've been coming here, of course, for the last 15 years, mm-hmm. you know, since I met and, and married my wife when we visited her family. But uh, yeah, Katie is absolutely gorgeous. Mm-hmm. We... we Several years ago, we, we took a camping trip up there in October, uh, and it was just it was just amazing. I want to go back. Yeah, full, um, full color. Yeah, and it's amazing, especially this time of year, right? Yeah. You know, so right now it's just it's lovely outside, and you know, it never gets really too hot. Nobody has air conditioning. Um, you know, there are it has its hot days, but uh, nothing like nothing like Texas. No. You know, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I you know I. I I would love to paint more of like the main coast. I'm sure that that's in my future somewhere down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, so it's sort of sort of funny that I you know I ended up moving you know about as far east as you can go to then still make se- southwestern paintings. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what's that? No, I was just gonna say I think that's that just shows the irony of it. It doesn't matter where you are if it's in you and you've got to paint it. It's just the way it yeah. is. You know. Yeah. And so, you know, we plan to make trips back, you know, because my family's still in Texas, so we'll mm-hmm. be going there often, and then, you know, I'll keep going back west, and, you know, my gallery's in Los Angeles, and, and I'll keep going back to Arizona. Arizona is an amazing state. Mm-hmm. But anyhow, um, so yeah, we love it here. We love being here, family, and, and the, the, the landscape of Maine is just mm-hmm. phenomenal. Yeah. And Portland's a really big city, too, so we're, we're in the suburbs around Portland, mm-hmm. and, um, it's just a nice, it's a beautiful city with, uh, with you know, history and great food. And mm-hmm. So, so that takes some of our New York boxes, you know, things that we missed about Yeah, I was going to say, I think part of it, though, where you are, you can always get down there if you want to. It's not too far for you from where, you, you know, from where you're probably living. Mm-hmm. So what would it be yeah. in a train? Is it, would it be a train or would it be a drive? Yeah, no, no public, no public trains um, here. But yeah, I mean, so we're we're uh, our house is actually going to be in South Portland, which is ten minutes, ten minute drive mm-hmm. over to Portland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow, really close. Yeah, and then how long would that take you to get down to New York if you wanted to go into New York? It's about a five hour drive, five and a half hours. Yeah, so it's doable. Yeah, if, if you wanted a long weekend, you could do it. For sure, and and the, and it's really easy to get there by plane as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. maybe half forty five minute of the plane ride or something. So. Yeah, nothing, nothing. So yeah. I guess then with that, um, I, I want to ask you about some of the people that you learned to paint with and and how they framed you. So it's not just the teachers that you you get something from; sure. it's your peers. So can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about that side of of an atelier that folks wouldn't know? Yeah, you mean so like when I was in the atelier or mm-hmm. or since or any of it? Um, yeah, I mean uh, it's hard to articulate in a way. I mean, I think it's sort of you you learn you know by osmosis almost. You know, somebody will kind of do you know if it's a certain brush, you know, or you know a certain technique or a certain color or some, something like that, and then everybody will kind of start doing it and explore a certain way, or you know, somebody will make a breakthrough and. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then of course, you know, uh, when I was in New York, I became 
uh, really good friends with Michael Klein, and he and I shared a studio together, and we, you know, we really kind of, you know, just sort of, I think, you know, bounced off of each other uh, really nicely, and, and um, you know, we, we were obviously we were just talking about everything, whether it's the philosophy of art, or, you know, the business side of things, or, you know, which is big, I mean, and a lot of people don't talk about that enough, I think, just how to actually make a, a living at this career, and, and do it in a stable way. Um, yeah, and then, and then just technically, obviously, we were watching each other paint, and I think there's, you know, there's just something that's so, uh, that's so nice about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the things that when we decided to leave New York, we were trying to sort of hold on to. So then we ended up moving to Raleigh for a little while mm -hmm. together with our, uh, with our friend Lewis Carr, and we, uh, we set up a little studio and started making instructional videos. And I mean, that's just a really uh, uh, rich environment and, uh, you know, something certainly that I, uh, I miss now, not having you know, quite as much of that around here in Maine, but um, it's nice to be in the Northeast where at least that, that is accessible, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'll, like you're saying, we get down to New York, certainly all up and down the coast near Boston and things like that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is that your question? Yeah, absolutely. I think the point is that out, out of the school um, environment, you are going to make um, friendships and come up with ideas with people who are like-minded. Um, not to say that you can't do it on your own, but yeah. I think there's definitely that footing. Um, I remember Daniel Keyes telling me one of, the, one of the biggest things he learned from Richard wasn't actually how to paint, it was how to run a business. Um, and it's, it's just as important, you know. Um, so touching on that and and i have to um completely say this out loud you you can nail that side of it i think you're really good at business um and knowing that you've got to make money to have this lifestyle to you know especially with yourself it's it's your wife your children to have a house over your head you know it, it, it's all well and good painting beautiful pieces but who's buying it um so i, I wanted to ask you a little bit of of a question and answer there on on what advice have you got to to folks so example number one get a good website or make sure you always carry business cards on you these are like 101 right make sure that your phone number is up to date and that people can get a hold of you and you call them back we we know those sorts of things and if we don't you should do but what what bits of advice can you give that are a bit extra that you think these are things that I really if it was my kids I would be saying to them you've got to start doing it like this yeah um, I mean I think you know one of the first like foundational hurdles a, a, an artist has to get over or at least it was in my experience and I think it's common among my peers it's just to uh, not neglect it I think so so many times I think artists there's this like there's like this myth of the bohemian, mm -hmm. right? Where like if the artist is just sort of like into their work, mm -hmm. then you know if they're if they're concentrating on the money side of things, and somehow it's not pure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's totally false. So I think that that's that's one thing. And then it's like you were saying. I mean, most of the business principles that any other uh, you know business uses to run successfully applies in its own way to art. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things I learned is that, is that if you can diversify your income, that's a great way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially to begin, right? So that um, so the metaphor is that, you know, several trickling streams mm -hmm. will lead into a flowing river, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got, uh, you know, an income stream through teaching, if you've got an income stream through, you know, selling videos, if you've got some through doing portrait commissions and you've got some from gallery works, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, you'll end up with something that, that's viable mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that you can count on uh, year over year. Because I think one of the, the larger stresses is just the volatility of the income, right? right? And then how do you plan for that? And that was, that was a big learning curve for me, especially as I, you know, started having a family mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, my wife is, uh, you know, we decided that she wanted she wanted to stay home with the kids, and so how then do I sort of support this thing right. and allow us to have a home and you know get a mortgage and things like that? So it, that that's all based on stability. So, um, so yeah, so diversity of income, I think that's the first thing. I think you've got to focus on a brand. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you, you know um, getting in the mindset of your collectors. If you know if the main goal is to sell things. Um, in the end, or if one of the larger goals, you know, is to sell paintings, 
you, you have to do it in a way that will be recognizable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and even, you know, and, and that tends to be more narrow than perhaps I wanted or like other artists tend to want. You know, you, you, you maybe the artistic experience is to sort of just, there's so much beauty and you want to respond to it as, you come, as it comes. And maybe you can, you know, to a certain degree. But also, I think if you want your, you know, your pains to sort of gain steam, right, your your brand to gain steam, uh, then you need to be known for something in particular, whatever that, you know, may be, you know, a particular style or a particular genre, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then that will start to have sort of a snowball, a snowball effect. So that um, can I just ask then on on that point? Did you find it difficult yeah. to segue into then the Western art from what you were known as? Because it, it is a re-identification in that sense. Um, yeah, I mean, well, and it's a transition. You know, I mean, it's not like a clean, it's not like a clean thing. And, and in some ways, like things can can run parallel. So you know, I'll still do a certain amount of portrait commissions mm -hmm. um, because I've gained a certain reputation in, in that world. Um, and sometimes they cross over, but actually not too much. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like. The, the Western art market is its own completely different thing. And so, you know, I can sort of start there and build it, you know, put a few paintings out there, start to build the brand. And then as that grows, um, you know, it, 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 I can then make decisions about how many portrait commissions I'm going to accept each year uh, or whatever, you know what I mean? So um, it's, uh, you know, and, and like anything else, it's still sort of, it's still in the works, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is only my second show uh, uh, doing Western work, mm -hmm. uh, but it's been really well received. Was, so that's really nice to see, and that gives me confidence. Okay, this is a this is a, uh, a proof of concept, yeah. right? Yeah. That that this you know uh, is a good direction to go in. I think um, if I if I can add my part on that, I think the fact is when people yeah. know that you can paint like you can you could probably paint anything <laughs> um, and people will follow yeah. it because you've got that reputation you've got that um clout an english phrase or um but like the the um the nuance behind you that people get it you know whereas i think yeah. if you're starting out you've you're totally right. You've got to have some sort of identity that we can turn around and we go, yep, yeah, that's something that they paint. That's something that they're known for. Um, I just want to touch on the commission thing because I think, um, and I hope you just correct me completely if I'm wrong here, but I, th I think some people have this stigma of, oh, you, you know, commissions are for when you can't um, make enough money doing your own work or um, that, you know, you've got to chase it for, for, for whatever reason. Can you... Um, tell everybody h how you view a commission and what the importance of it is and why you've carried on doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, and portrait commissions uh, have long been, you know, um, uh, you know there's, there's historical precedent, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, artists, since they learned how to paint, were doing portrait commissions. Right. And, you know, you walk, you walk into any museum, you know, many of the examples you see on the wall are going to be or even portrait commissions. And so I think that there's, you know, um, it, it's a great way to make a living. It's a great, it's obviously it's a great way to connect with your, your client, right? You know, because they're, you're painting something either themselves, you're painting somebody that they love. And so that immediate, that has that immediately uh, emotional connection, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, to them. And, I, and that's very, very satisfying. I really enjoy that part, uh, you know, in, whether it's an unveiling or, you know, um, just you know, people's sincere uh, feedback about you know what the what the painting uh, means to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I had the opportunity to do a few uh, posthumous uh, portraits, and uh, you know, I mean, just it, it 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 really taps into that sort of um, humanity, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's painting it's painting people, which is the thing that I love to do the most anyway. I think uh, you know, there's. It, it, you know, just so much, whether it's just the expression of a person or, you know, um, anyway, it's just, a, it's a never, it's a never ending, um, you know, bottomless pit or whatever, you know, yeah, of, yeah. Of, yeah, of I things to explore. Uh, so, I'm just um, going to, Josh, before you say anything, can you move to your right, like two inches? Yeah, that'll do. 
Just because I keep getting a little <laughs> glimpse of, of that ear and not quite the full ear. There you go. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm moving as I philosophize. No, that's uh, fine. Carry on. So what was I, what was I talking about about the Porsche Commission? Yeah. Um, Just that it was a bottomless yeah, pit. Yeah, I mean, a bottomless pit at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. But then there is that, of course, that dance between sort of like you know your vision and then doing what the what the client, um, uh, you know, what they had in mind, and mm -hmm. you know sometimes there can be sort of a push and pull, and that just takes a certain amount of you know people's skills or business skills to be able to kind of uh, you know um, compromise or you know uh, express your vision and pitch your vision in a way that makes them realize you know or, or, or uh, helps them sort of see that they your vision is getting them everything that they want and mm -hmm. they'll end up with a piece that has, you know, uh, legs, right? That'll, that'll be significant for, you know, generations to come. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's a certain amount of education that has to be involved, but, um, you know, I think that there's, there's a place for that, you know, and I think that artists, you know, I always talk about, um, you know, there's a famous example of Michelangelo how he, you know, he didn't really initially set out to do the Sistine Chapel, mm -hmm. right? That was his sort of, he, he took that commission, spent four years on it, right? So he did it to, you know, the utmost. But uh, what he really wanted was a, the sculpture commission, mm -hmm. right? The, uh, this sort of funerary monument. Um, and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the angel has got to do it then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, um, yeah. You know what I mean? Definitely. I think um, one of the things that people struggle with is knowing that they, they, they or fearing that they're not going to have their own style once it's once it's a commission. So I guess, yeah. how can you give people advice on that, that making sure that it's still unique to you, but it is what the um, the person wants? What, what, what do you do? <laughs> how do you get that one across? Well, I think in some sense it's inevitable. You know, I think that... Um, you, you can't, it's like your own handwriting. You can't help but have yourself come out mm -hmm. no matter what the situation is. Um, you know, but then on the other side, you, I think you, you, uh, you have to figure out how to, um, uh, I don't know if assert yourself is the right word or, or you know, um, hold firm to certain things. Right, respect, but, respect um, your, your, your own style as well as what they want. Yeah, but then, and of course, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And, uh, you know, so maybe some something I've learned is the more kind of like, you know, education or, or, or examples I can give kind of up front. Because my, in my experience, people just, they're, they're not used to this. You know, we live in a world where portrait painting is far less common than, you know, maybe it was 100 and some odd years ago. And so they're, they're, they're approaching their vision of something through, you know, the ubiquitous photographs and iPhone snapshots and things that they've seen. And that's their, that's their conception of what a portrait looks like. And so then it's your job to, you know, quickly give them, you know, some sense of what this is going to look like and that they're going to be happy with it to just sort of like, yeah, uh, bring down maybe a sense of just sort of fear, I guess, that mm -hmm. it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the more that you can do that, like up front, and the more that you can kind of sort of shape that vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and different clients have different just sort of personalities, right? Mm -hmm. Where some will just sort of say, totally trust you and go with it. Yeah. And, you know, and then other will want to be sort of brought in uh, in different parts of the process. So. So there is the formal side of it as well, obviously, where you've had to have things put in play. And do you do you recommend that? Do you recommend a good back and forth and making sure there's a contract in play, or is that something that you don't always need? Um, uh, it depends. I think the better thing to do is to have it sort of written out. You know, I think then even if it's just very very simple, you know, yeah. you know, you can you can find these templates online and just like a portrait commission. You know, just like you set out very simple things of like. This is this is the size it's going to be. This is how much it's going to cost. This is the projected you know date of completion. You know, just so that your your clarity is always better. You know, in any business dealing, but you know, in, in these ways. Um, you know, but I guess I speak. You you there are people you have different relationships with in the sense of like if it's a friend of a friend, you feel comfortable. You can accept a certain amount of risk, I suppose, if you mm -hmm. don't want to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never really had it. 
mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or bad experiences. Um, but you can't, I think you can't go wrong when you're simple. Do you know, I, know, at the terms. I know people are going to listen to that and feel, find it really useful because it's almost a question that perhaps some people feel like they can't ask because if they're not doing their own style and their own thing, they may be seen as failing. And I, and I really wanted to get across that I don't, I, well, you're not failing and you can do both. And that's something like you say that the old masters did. And if, if they didn't, we wouldn't have half the museums built. So it's a much nicer way of yep. thinking about a commission. And I, yeah. I'm all for that. Okay, let me keep yeah. asking you some more questions. Um, I know you yeah. touched on it before, but um, I I said, um, do you ever paint plain air? So obviously where you are and what you're doing, I, I, I wanted to pull that into really, that somebody messaged in to ask that, but um, talk a bit more about the Hudson School then, the Hudson School of Painters and what they do there and how that might steer into your plain air work. Sure. Uh, well, so do you mean like the, the modern Hudson River School yeah. that, that, that I studied at? Yeah. Um, well, I, unfortunately, I've only been able to go uh, one year. It was the, the year they founded it. This must have been 2007 or eight or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I think, it, you know, the, the idea is to just sort of revive the, um, you know, the philosophy, the technique, the traditions of the Hudson River School painters, you know, the late 19th century guys like... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Thomas Moran, Thomas Cole, uh, um, Frederick Church, um, and, you know, so they're, we're going to those places where they were and, um, just being inspired by the environment. But the idea is, you know, if you're going out to nature and you're taking your paints and your plain air box or the shot box or, or whatever, and, um, and just responding to the light and, and having to sort of uh, you know, figure out atmospheric perspective. How do you respond as it changes, and you know, it push you know mountain distant mountains back, mm-hmm. and, and how do you, how do you how do you take this you know incredibly dynamic range of values? Nature's so bright mm-hmm. and so colorful. How do you how do you make that uh, you know illusion in, in paint? I mean, it's just uh, you know it, you can't, of course, but you can make you can make obviously sort of a, a really you know, exciting. Uh, sort of facsimile of it, but but the idea is just to be outside, to be among nature, to learn from nature, and that's your that's your your, your teacher. You know, it, it's way. definitely if I had to go to a school, if I had to go to a school, it would be the one I wanted want to go to. I just I think it would just be so, like you said earlier, how you know how many times in your life can you just sit down for forty hours and do one thing? And I think for me, yeah. something like that would just be the most relaxing zen. I know that it's not because you're, you're stressed out trying to figure out what yeah. it is, but but there is the element yeah. of just being able to be outside and it being the reason why you're there. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that sounds like my bag. So I guess then... Well, I'm not- sorry. Oh, well, I mean, obviously a lot of people love it too. I mean, I think you're not alone. Yeah. The plane air movement has grown yeah. like crazy in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. The yeah. amount of people... Who are who are painting outside and creating groups together across the country, and it's just exploded, which is cool. Across the world, it's huge. It's it's big over here as well. It's it's big in Europe. There's more than just America, Josh. Okay. I know. Um, Okay, well, talking about more than just America, I want to touch on the places that you've taught workshops because, well, I, I firstly I wanted to ask you, have you been out to China? I know that you're represented out there. But have you been have you been yeah. out to China? Have you ever taught out there? What's what's Yeah, well so I, I haven't been since twenty seventeen. Mm-hmm. Uh thereabouts. Um but yeah, I, I went I went almost every year there for about five or six years. Wow. Um wow. and uh that was primarily due to portrait commissions. Mm-hmm. Um I I had I had originally showed in two thousand twelve with a group of American painters. Um, we showed it at a museum in Beijing and then traveled around to several, um, several cities in China. And, um, so it was from that, I, I did a commission of a museum director and some of her family and then kind of, you know, that, that went into, you know, her, their group and, uh, of, of acquaintances and, you know, friends and that. Um, yeah, I mean, that was just such an amazing experience. I, uh, um, I really enjoyed all my trips. Of course, I I, I was relying on um, uh, my agent. His name is Stephen Lane. Who's one of 
he helped sort of found the, the, the show back then. And then he, he sort of functioned as, uh, you know, well, my agent. But of course, like when we were in China, he would travel with me and I, mm-hmm. he had to translate. And, you know, it, I've never felt kind of like a more foreign place just because I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, you can't read, you know, the signs and, and things yeah. like that. But it was, it, you know, an amazing experience. Love the food. Um, and uh, I would love to see more of that. I really spent most of my time in Beijing and then and, and Shanghai a lot of opportunity. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting really interesting place. That's the place after the pandemic then you could go. Would you go back with your children, with your family? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I, I think tra- <laughs> the thought of just traveling with a four-year-old, um, you know, uh, <laughs> internationally, I think anywhere, uh Kind of raises my stress level, but um, I would definitely, I would love to, you know, take them back. I wanted my wife to go. Yeah. Uh, she was going to go with me on the very first trip we went that I went on in 2012, and that was right when she was pregnant with our first child, and so you know we just didn't know if she was going to react well to like the you know, long flight and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I would love to go back. Mm-hmm. Where and else? Take, where else have you taught then? I know that you've taught in Italy a bunch of times, right? Yeah. And in Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I taught the Edinburgh ATA. Mm-hmm. I taught um, at, um, right in Italy, um, and I guess that's really the only. I feel like oh no, Spain. Spain a couple uh-huh. times. Okay. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah. So the segue to that is so that those... you're coming to Yorkshire. I'm sorry. I know we got yes. we got jilted then. Um, so this is something that I was, you know. We've been trying to plan this for ages, and I'm yeah. in a in a, a funny position here where I can't do loads of workshops every year because it's not my everyday job, as you know. My yeah. everyday job is brushes, um, so we just try and pick you know who I think would go well as a group of people over a year, and that people would want to study from. Um, and yeah. it, it's I can't believe it, but obviously we've been put off by the pandemic and things. But it's just so exciting um, to welcome. I, I can't wait. I, I know that you're going to just be. Uh, well, you can do it with your eyes shut. I know that, but it, it's it's just going to be so cool to have someone, quite honestly, of your caliber, of your understanding of of shifting paint and using a brush i just i'm pinching myself because it's just next level and it's just yeah brilliant well thank you i'm so excited I, i'm i'm glad we're uh we're we're gonna be able to make it happen and it's, finally. It's, i know and it's finally i know um what a, what a crazy year i mean everything is just sort of you know Combined. been just yeah, yeah but I, I can't wait to come out there i can't wait to see your beautiful uh, space and I've never been to Yorkshire um and it just looks absolutely lovely um but yeah and I you know I love to teach um I'm I'm actually doing you know less and less of it now mm-hmm. um just because I've had to you know I'm, I'm trying to sort of stay fiercely behind the easel as much as I can so I think my workshop with you will be one of two that I'm going to do next year um and uh that's you know worldwide the only other one's going to be in Utah mm-hmm. and uh but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I, I love to you know get a group of students together and um, you know give them a crash course in portrait painting, uh, which essentially is you know what workshops are. Yeah. But I'll take I take it through the entire process. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that, touching on where you've come foundation wise and the hours that you've put in, forty hour uh, weeks, if not more. I'm I've no doubt of that. I'm just saying, just from the atelier days. How can you, I mean, it's a tricky question probably, but how do you condense something to give people some sort of fighting chance within a workshop? What's the, what's the idea there? Yeah, um, well, you know, it, uh, what I try to impart are those foundational concepts that I spoke of earlier, you know. What are the things that I, you know, these problem-solving tools, as I like to talk about them, that, that people can then, you know, uh, hopefully sort of assimilate or understand in some degree and then give them the opportunity to do self-learning. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so whether that's how do I problem solve drawing, mm-hmm. um, just drawing accurately, proportionately, 
Uh, you know, because those are the two foundational things that everybody struggles with across the board, and particularly when it comes to portrait painting, is the drawing. Um, because you, you've got to have stuff in the right way. You've got to be, you've got to pay attention to you know, the small nuances and the shape of somebody's nose or the spacing of their eyes or whatever that makes them makes them down. And then uh, understanding value relationships, right? So so drawing and form. How do we create the illusion of forms? And, and that's really the the you know the pillars on, on which everything else uh, that I teach in the workshop uh, hangs. And so you know, I, I definitely color cover. How I think about color mixing, uh, how I think about paint handling. You know, we, we talk a little bit about sort of making an archival painting or a painting that's going to last a long time. Um, so, uh, but it, but it covers the gamut. And so, what I what I hope the students walk away with are you know a bunch of these ideas. People take notes, and you know they you know, they can then use that to uh, you know hopefully you know uh, uh, run with. Yeah, yeah. And I've had great feedback. And, um, I, I, you know, I can tell you, I've, I've had students tell me that you, you're an amazing teacher. That's, I have no doubt of that. Um, I, think, I think the biggest thing that some folks have asked is what kind of level they have to have to come into this. Um, and I, I can answer you um, how I've said it to folks, which is pretty much any level is going to get something from it. Um, all I can say is, as a student, I'll make it really clear to you what sort of level people are at so that you've got an idea of how you go in to teach them. Because there's no point, you know, if you've got somebody that's that studied for three years and that they've got the basics or a good understanding of, they don't want you to come in with the basics at that point. They need that step up. And it's important that you would know that as a teacher. Um, so, I, you know, I've had a couple of folks inquire about, you know, if they're not going to be good enough. And it's, it's not really a about that I think for folks who haven't been in a workshop style environment they don't understand that you're not pitching up against everybody else it's not about that um, even though you know you'll be at the front we'll have demonstration at times and you'll come around the room and critique it it's not the whole you're not doing it right you know put that down it's it's very different to that you know and I think that's a little bit intimidating for some folks that they, they get worried that then they're, they're going to be spotlighted as the person that can't do it um yeah that I, I get that I mean that I um that happens at every every workshop and I welcome all all levels mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways you know I think um you know it's good when people come in with, without a whole lot of uh, experience or, or backgrounds because then I can kind of I can kind of lay the foundation mm -hmm. uh, fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know, so a lot of and a lot of you know what am I teaching and you know in the lectures uh, you know I try to talk about things that people have been taught or maybe you know they're they're just confused about that that tripped them up mm -hmm. and uh, you know so I. I've taught people of, of every, you know, every workshop. There's a range uh, of skill levels, and, and um, so it really isn't about that. And, I, and, and it offers something to everybody you know, because I'm going to go around and the the individualized teaching, you know, uh, uh, cover covers all the bases. But yeah. even in my experience, if people have studied uh, in different schools, um, the you know the information and the concepts I've taught tend to be you know uh, new or at least sort of fill in some sort of gap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to say, and it's a, sh a shameless plug, but it's worth me saying it. I'm going to put a post at the bottom um, for for your DVD as well. That I think if somebody okay. isn't sure about um, what it's all about, or they they want to study from you but they're not sure in person yet, I think that that's something that I know that you you smashed nearly every record on your DVD, which is, is brilliant. So how many hours was it in the end, the DVD? The DVD, I think it's 16 or just over. So it's a long haul. <laughs> it's nearly every brushstroke. I mean, I, and I, I really tried to put the, um, you know, the, the, the full, uh, the full gamut of everything, you know, mm -hmm. all the information that, that people need to, um, uh, you know, to make a successful portrait. Obviously, practice is you know something mm -hmm. that everybody has to go through. But yeah, I worked really hard to put to put all the, the right information in there. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Now I'm going to finish off on one more thing because if I don't talk about brushes, my mom's going to kill me. Um, we filmed yeah. your brush set this week, and I'm going to post it now and just play it. It's a one minute clip, and then I'm going to ask you three questions. So you have to think whilst we're showing this. One is 
why did you decide to use our brushes? Um, two is how do you clean them? And three is a question I want everybody to answer, which is what do you expect from a brush life expectancy? Okay, mm. so here we go. Yeah. There you go. I um I know you haven't seen that yet, but it's basically a load of brushes spinning around and Joe filmed us um brush no. brush flinging around and uh I know that for a lot of people it, it looks really cool um because it's something that you don't normally see with a paintbrush. So I was like, yeah, let's end it. It comes up with your signature at the end. It, it looks good, Josh, don't worry. So I don't know. Hit yeah, me see. with some answers um, to my questions, if you can remember them, or I can ask yeah. them again. No, no, I remember, yeah, I mean, well, obviously I use your brushes, I think, because of the quality, the, the consistency. I mean, um, you know, I haven't tried anything that I've ever liked better. It, it allows I me mean, to handle a couple of paints in a way that I'm, that I'm looking for, you know, without having to fuss, to fuss with it. I mean, the thing, this is hard enough without having to you know, manage your brushes that, that, that aren't holding up, you know, uh, right. under pressure or whatever. Um, but yeah, so they, they last a long time. Um, uh, you guys are obviously very easy to work with, so it's very easy to, you know, as I need them to, uh, you know, to get more. And, um, they're, you know, they're top quality at every level. Um, uh, how do I clean them? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I clean them? Well, you know, I'm probably uh, I probably don't do it often enough, <laughs> but I have I have I have a linseed oil soap. I have a linseed oil soap that you know when they when they really are getting um, uh, you know grimed up or whatever, then I'll, then I'll do that at the end of the day. Wait, um, wait, 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 wait! Yeah. You're not getting away with it like that. Go from the beginning. So you are we saying that you don't really clean them? I'm not as often as I should. I do. So that's not every not session. As, not as often as I should. What? So that's not every session. Not every session, no. <laughs> Josh! People won't yeah, believe I know. this. Give me, give me a Tell me what I should be doing. Well, no, I, I, um, I, I just know that people won't believe this. I'm open cause... to it. I'm open to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so if... I'm, I'm a, you know. How about this? Why don't you talk about how you should clean your brushes? How you th if you did clean them, what would you be doing? Yeah, well, I think um, <laughs> you want me to go through the whole process. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so liquid oil soap, warm water, you know, rubbing, you know, uh, rubbing them in your hands, washing them, mm -hmm. laying them down uh, flat, uh, you know, on a paper towel, trying to clear, clean out from the ferrule, mm -hmm. right, so applying a little pressure to, to sort of draw, uh, you know, to draw all the sediments and water out, um, rather than, you know, uh, sort of leaving, leaving them upright, right, to dry. Right. That's so funny. Do you you know, tell me, whatever. No, no, you're good. I just, I think it's really important for people to hear this because um, so many people spend hours and hours and hours cleaning brushes. Um, and it's it's one of the questions we get asked the most, which is how, how do you clean them? And I think it's it's good for people to see from one one end of the spectrum to the other. And when I say to folks, oh, you know, Josh does it like this, they'll they'll be like, no, really? What he doesn't do it like X, Y, and you, no, that's just you know. Um, I guess on that question though, answer my last one for me. What is the sort of expectancy you have with a brush? Because because it's something that I struggle to answer for folks. Uh, the life expectancy. Um, I guess it depends on the brush. I mean, the the you know the stiffer brushes like your ivories, mm -hmm. they'll last longer just because they're they're you know uh, 
a stiffer bristle, which is going to, you know, put up with more abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's sort of like the softer synthetics and in particular the smaller brushes, mm-hmm. um, because I tend to be, um, you know, I use them a lot when I'm really getting down to the details mm-hmm. and, you know, I'm, I'm usually, um, doing a lot of changing the color and things like that. I've never been able to, um, kind of have like a, you know, one brush per color or mm-hmm. one brush per value kind of person. Maybe I'm relatively disorganized and that's something that I need to, I need to, uh, to change. But, um, yeah, so anyway, so by, when I'm changing, you know, a color, I'm changing a value or something like that. I'm cleaning the brush more if it's just wiping it out in a paper towel mm-hmm. uh, or something. I mean, I've tried to use, uh, one thing I have changed in recent history is I'm trying to cut out using any kind of solvent. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, it's just not really the painting. And, and then, of course, it, it uh uh, causes the brushes to break down a lot more quickly. So, yeah. um, so I've eliminated that as much as I possibly can. What are you uh, using then? You know, what are you using? That's going to be the question. Uh, the salt, you know, instead of solvent, mm-hmm. just just nothing. Like I, I can either clean it maybe with a little bit of oil, or I can get most of it out with a paper towel. Really? Um, if I really to go to like a really high value, something that's pure and white and colorful, then maybe you know I, I've got my little Turks can. Um, to the side, I'll take the lid off, you know, and, and give it a quick, uh, you know, quick rinse in there and try to get all of that solvent back out. Mm-hmm. Maybe even put a little bit of oil back into it so that the solvent isn't, you know, breaking down the paint mm-hmm. uh, within the brush. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, as little as, as little as I can, really. Do you know, I wish that you could tell everyone in the world that because people don't get that solvents are bad for your health and also kill paintbrushes. They ab- it absolutely strips them. Yeah. Um, my best way of saying it to folks is if you wouldn't put it on your hair, why would you, why would you put it on the end of a brush? Um, and I know she's a good friend of yours too, uh, natural pigments, Tatiana. She's told me so many horror stories of people with solvents and I'm just like going crazy for it. Why, why would you do it? But I get it. It's easy. So then people ask the question, what would you use instead? So if you're saying then just don't, or at that point use oil, what kind of oil are you using? Uh, well, I'll have oleo gel from Natural Pigments okay. yeah. um, out on the palette, and I can just put a little bit in the brush, and that's that's usually enough to clean it. Um, what I would really do, and this is what they recommend, I just haven't made the, the, the transition yet for no, I have no excuse, but just to have maybe like a silicoil, so it's like those glass jars with the, with the um, metal, you know, um, coil inside, uh, filled up with you're really, I mean, it could be a linseed oil. I think they even recommended, you know, uh, like food grade oils. I can't remember if yeah. it, it exactly, you know, but you can get like, you know, a, a cheaper oil, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and then you, you because that, that's plenty solvents enough to Absolutely. break, you know, to get the sediments out of your brush. So. I know so many folks who use veg oil, um, vegetable oil that you can get okay. in the bucket yeah, road. Yeah. Um, and, and I think at that point, why aren't we trying this? What would, you know, the thing I, I can say to folks that actually makes a bit more sense is what would the masters have used? Because they were not using Terps. They were not using White Spirit or any brand insert odorless stuff here. They weren't using it. Um, and then people start to wonder how their brushes lasted for so long. And, and you know, they were making their own brushes, a lot of them. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. it's it's the Did contested. Did they have a time? Please don't know. Oh yeah, it's about my third most frequently asked question along alongside um, can I get a free mail order catalogue and where in the world are you? <laughs> it's probably, you know, it's up there. Um, and it's 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 right. We have um we have a duty to try and help people um, to do that. So I have no problems um, answering it. But I think that's why it's important people see a working artist that's kicking ass um and that quite frankly isn't cleaning the brushes every five minutes that a lot of people will think that you do so thank you for highlighting a point that i didn't know about you but i'm happy to learn (laughs) (laughs) do this is i mean by all means do it the right way i mean i i'm sure you you uh you know about it better better than i do but yeah so oil is the best the best thing to use Mm -hmm. to, to clean your brushes Right. I mean, my only thing is I just haven't figured out how to get the veg oil out of the brush, but I'm sure probably most of it's just, you know, can be done with a paper towel. Yeah, just wiping Um, it out. Just wiping it out and then um, good old fashioned soap and water at the sink at the end of it. I, I see no reason why that doesn't work, you know. Um, I tell you what we sh- we should do. Um, I don't know if you can hear Max barking. Could you hear him? I did, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's ready for a walk, eh? Yeah, he's thinking it's dinner time. Um, but I was just going to say then, I'm going to put lots of links down at the bottom. And one of the things I think, if I can pressurize you when you're here, is just to make a three or four minute video um, of you cleaning your brushes in Yorkshire. And I can post it this yeah. time next year, just so people can see actually a little process that you do go through because everybody wants to learn this sort of stuff. So um, you're going to have to clean them when you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. I'll probably, maybe that'll be the thing that'll finally get me uh, get my habits right. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. I um, I'm gonna wrap this up. We've gone on for a little longer than than normal, but I'm thrilled about that. Um, absolutely. And I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your constant commitment to me and my mum and our brushes. Um, I'm gonna actually. I want to send you a couple of the new red dot brushes i don't think you've you've tried them yet this red dot range um but it's an yeah. alternative kalinsky alternative to kalinsky sable um because we can't ship kalinsky sable to the states at the moment which is a nightmare yeah. so we've we've tried to come up with a substitute so i want you to try them and see what you think for this time next year when you come over um wow. and uh, yeah i can't wait to welcome yeah. you it's been a long time coming um but you're going to be welcome with open arms from mom and i well, thanks. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on this, and I can't wait to see you guys out there. Um, hopefully, it won't be, you know, hopefully the things will be opened up and, and traveling will be a lot easier yeah. between now and then, and yeah. maybe we'll run into each other before that. So, yeah, definitely. Um, if, if, yeah, if, 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 great. Looking forward to it. If I can get out to the States, I'm there, trust me. Um, it's just obviously if, if it's safe to do so and when we can. So, I hope to see of you course. soon. Great. Thanks, Simi.